Hey there. Today on the podcast, we're going to learn what it was like to work in the model shop with so many legendary Imagineers during the late 70s and early 80s, plus info on Epcot Center projects like the model for Smart One or sculpting the fountain at the Land Pavilion with former Imagineer Jim Sarno. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me here on episode 76 of the Tomorrow Society podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton, and it is stunning to me to look back at the history of this show and realize that we are almost up to four years of doing this podcast. The first interview I did with Ryan Ritchie appeared on August 28th, 2015, so we're about a month away from being four years of just having really fun conversations with a wide range of people. And I've been really fortunate, especially in the past year, to talk with people that worked behind the scenes at Disney in a wide range of disciplines. And today's guest is a perfect example. Jim Sarno, who started at Disney in early 1979 and quickly moved over to the model shop where he worked for about five years. And he was there at such an interesting time for the company with Epcot Center really getting rolling around that time. They were redoing Fantasyland at Disneyland and then eventually would get primed for Tokyo a bit after that. And this all kind of led into when Michael Eisner was going to take over the company and really things would take off. But especially the focus was on Epcot Center. And Jim worked on models for certain parts of Journey into Imagination, a part of Spaceship Earth, also the Fountain at the Land Pavilion, which is not even there anymore, which is a stunning creation of Walt Paragoy, and then Jim sculpted it, and Smart One, which I remember actually experiencing, which was a small robot that asked you trivia questions, and for a kid in the mid-80s, That blew my mind. And that really is just the tip of the iceberg of things that Jim worked on. But beyond that, the thing that I really took away from this interview was the impact that the people that Jim worked with, especially a lot of the old school legendary Imagineers like Harriet Burns and Walt Paragoy, and even the influence of Fred Jerger, who's someone who was so important to Disneyland and Walt Disney World. And Jim just has a lot of great stories about his experiences working with that group and others. And I got the impression that he had a really cool time with Disney. Despite only being there for about five years, it was quite an experience that made an impact throughout his life. Before I get to the conversation with Jim, I wanted to briefly mention this is a listener-supported podcast. And what that means is that there's no sponsors or advertisements, but there is a way to support the show by becoming a member through Patreon. And there's some really cool perks, including a membership pin and card, plus access to exclusive podcasts like the monthly Tomorrow Society Bulletin. And you can learn more by going to tomorrowsociety.com slash member, and you can find all about becoming a member of the Tomorrow Society. So it was really cool to talk to Jim. He's going to be appearing at the Retro Magic event that the guys from the Retro Disney World podcast are doing in October. You should definitely look into that, especially if you're in the Florida area. It's a stunning group of Disney legends and interesting people that have connections to the company, including Jim. And there's a link to that in the show notes. And I just had a blast talking with Jim and learning more about his story. So let's get right to it. Let's talk to Jim Sarno. (laughs) 
what I've come down to now in my life is I'm teaching kids art. When I go in, I bring my portfolio and it's a little story about how I was the little kid, five years old, that had ears that stuck out. And of course, my nickname was Dumbo. You know, I grew into that even in my career, but it was a horrible nickname. I hated it. I'd come home from school crying. And, uh, you know, somehow when I got to Disneyland, I looked around, I said, they all have big ears. Dumbo lives here, Goofy, Pluto, Mickey, and everybody loves them. When I go home to school, they hate me and make fun of me. So I told my parents, I want to live here. (laughs) Of course, they wouldn't leave me at Disneyland where I wanted to be because I grew up in the San Fernando Valley close. And uh, when I got home, I got a shoebox. I was filling it with all kinds of stuff. My mom said, Jimmy, what are you up to? I said, I'm going to build my own Disneyland. So in my mind from an early age was this thought, I definitely want to be part of that. And it was all in miniature because here I was doing little models as I was a kid, kind of a loner that stayed in the house doing artwork all the time. And I went to Cal State Northridge and wanted to study toy design. Found out that was in New York, didn't want to move there. So I said, well, Sesame Street, uh, you know. Whatever is going on in L.A. that has to do with kids and art. And I fell into this wonderful position with Sid and Marty Croft. If you don't know the history of that, the boss that I worked under who hired me was Ken Forsey. Do you know his name? Only slightly. I would love to learn more for sure. Okay. So I know that you had an interest in uh, the rehab of Country Bear Jamboree, or at least hopefully they're thinking of it. He worked on Country Bear Jamboree. He was in the model shop working with all the people I ended up working with, probably in the 60s and 70s. So he was there with Rowley and uh, Harriet and all kinds of wonderful old timers and model shop. He ended up at Sid and Marty Croft running their model shop, and he hired me to work for them. While we were working, he was working on this teddy bear called Teddy Ruxpin. That came out of the fact that he worked on Country Bear Jamboree, and he said, wouldn't it be great if kids had their own teddy bear that could talk and sing? So it was pretty amazing that just this fluky job I started in would introduce me to him, and he knew I wanted to work at Disney, and when he had to lay me off, he got me an interview in the model shop with Bob Sewell. They were getting ready to sign the contract with uh, Tokyo for Tokyo Disney, and Bob said he wanted to hire me, Everything was delayed. It didn't happen. Ken had to lay me off. He said, Jim, if I ever do this teddy bear, you're coming to work for me. So years later, Ken got in touch with me. And this was after Disney. I went and worked on Teddy Ruxpin. It was was quite a nice start. And in between, I moved to Hawaii. I came back and I went to work for Hanna-Barbera, working on the Flintstones and all their characters that were full-size costumes for Marineland, actually. That led to me seeing a a newspaper article that Mapo was hiring for body parts, somebody to make animatronics. It didn't say animatronics. It just said fiberglass fabrication. I said, well, after doing the characters for Marineland, I think I could qualify for that. I'm pretty sure I found out what Mapo was before I went. And in the interview, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. I'm always forgetting him. In the interview, he says, Jim, it looks like your portfolio says you belong in the model shop. I wasn't going to be stupid enough to say yes, because I didn't see any ad for model shop people. (laughs) And my dad had taught me, if you want to get in somewhere, go in and sweep floors if you have to. So I said, well, I know fiberglass and I know body parts. And I said, no, 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 I'm really into (laughs) sculpting and, and, and fiberglass work. Far from the truth, but I got hired. I took the job. And every day, oh, the guy's name was Rick Goldie. Every day he'd say, Jim, how are you doing? How do you like your job? Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, I'm itching from all the fiberglass, you know. During the first couple of weeks, I, when lunch came or breaks, you could wander all over the lot. And of course, I wanted to see the model shop. And sure enough, I belonged in there. I wanted to be there. You know, it was the huge Epcot model in the middle of the, the, the room. And I said, wow. How can I ever get in here? Well, I met Maggie Elliott, the manager at the time. She wanted to see my portfolio. They needed people. Of course, it wasn't advertised in the newspaper. 
She said, Jim, I'd like to hire you. Great. She says, where are you working now? I said, Maple. I'm sorry, we can't hire you. I went back to work at Maple. I said, if Rick asks me tomorrow, I'm going to be bold and tell him. So sure enough, Jim, how do you like your job? I said, I like it, but I want to talk to you. Told him I had met Maggie. She wanted to hire me, but couldn't. He said, Jim, come to my office. I go to Rick's office. He makes a phone call. Okay, he's talking to Maggie. Hangs up. He says, Jim, don't tell anybody what's going on. But on Monday, you report to the model show. Wow. <laughs> Is that amazing? I don't even know how it happened, but it's, it's one of those magical times in life where you know something's working beyond you, you know? <laughs> yeah. So so you moved over to the model shop. And what was that atmosphere like? Because you mentioned the big Epcot model and so many amazing people worked there. What was that like? Well, you know, it's nice for me to reminisce and think about these things because when it happens, you're just kind of in shock. It's very exciting. But when I think now of what had happened that I didn't realize at the time, so I get there and Maggie gives me a booth and, you know, we each had cubicles around the big model. Now, the model itself is so impressive. I know we're working on this huge last stream of Disney, and I can't believe I'm going to be part of it. What tops it off is either that I am in the cubicle that Fred Jerger had. Do you know who he is? Yeah, yeah. There were so yeah. many legends there at that time. Fred is like, he's the beginning of Disneyland. He's out there on the property. He's making models. He's doing the installation. He's just extremely important. Well, I don't know him or know anything about him until I realized that I'm sitting right next to Harriet Burns. Yeah, wow. I didn't know who she was. You know, I was this innocent young guy who was just thrilled to be part of being in the studios. So as I get to know Harriet, I start to realize who this is I'm sitting next to. And she and I became best friends. We played and laughed and had the best time, irritated Maggie to death because, you know, here she's watching her shop and she sees these two cackling away and telling stories. But that was Harriet. Everybody came to visit Harriet. She, do you know much about her? I know her basic bio, you know, but I, I need to, I know she has a book that I believe her daughter wrote about her that I would love to read. That's on my list. <laughs> so Harriet's daughter, Pam, and, and I was always concerned about Harriet because she was getting older. We worked together for five, six years, and then I got laid off. She continued working. And when she got retired, or when she retired, I was concerned, you know, what if something happens to her? I'll never know how to find out. Well, it turns out that she did go in for a very serious heart surgery at 79. And I got somehow put in the link of understanding the procedure, and I had spoken with her right before her surgery, but I knew I needed to be in touch with the family. So somehow I got on this link, and they kept updating me on her condition. She passed away. The heart surgery didn't go well. <laughs> she had said to me before, she says, you know, Jim, I made up so many glues to build Disneyland. She goes, they got to find a glue that'll pass my heart together. Oh. And it didn't work. So... She passed away, and her daughter, Pam, got a hold of me and asked me to speak at her memorial. And I said, well, Harriet has all these dear friends. I said, why are you asking me? She goes, all the rest of them are dead. <laughs> I knew that Pam had the same sense of humor as Harriet. Just <laughs> said whatever, uh, just full of fun. She said, Jim, you're a friend and a colleague. I would love it if you could speak. So Pam spoke. Marty Scalar and myself. And then her idea was to put this book together with all the crazy characters that knew Harriet and everybody write a page or a story about their time working with Harriet. I came up with an idea to design a scarf because Harriet was like a little Southern belle and she wore pearls and a scarf and gloves. And so I said, wouldn't it be great when people buy this book, they get a scarf that has all the symbols of Harriet on it. So I designed that for them, and then the book took off, and everybody enjoyed it. So there's a story in there about me, with Harriet, and 
it happens a few times where both of us are out sick. And the shop was like a playground for creative people. We were all similar in age. There was the older group and the new younger ones. It was like the dream come true of me wanting to live at Disneyland. I got to live in the shop with the most creative, entertaining people you'd ever meet. Harriet and I are out sick a few times, and we get razzed, like, what are you two up to? And they knew what fun we had together. So sure enough, one day, Harriet comes and she goes, Jim, we were both out yesterday. You know what they're going to do to us. I said, oh, yeah. She goes, I got a plan. I said, what? She says, first person who asks us, we're going to tell them. We took off to Acapulco and eloped. We're now married. (laughs) This was Harriet's sense of humor. (laughs) So throughout our friendship, there was all there was always a joke about Nietzsche and Acapulco at our favorite place. You know, I would go to Acapulco on trips and I'd send her gifts. Well, in the end, when she passed away and I'm helping clean out her house, I'm finding all the things they gave her: the cards from Acapulco, the postcards, the playing cards, all the Christmas cards. And she had said to me when I first met her, Jim, I used to have a friend that we both sent. Naughty birthday card. Would you like to do that? I said, sure. And anybody who knows Harriet, as prim and proper as she was, she could tell the dirtiest jokes. And I think she learned to do this because here she is in the 50s in an all-male shop, and there's Harriet. And she, I think she knew to survive. If she could tell a dirty joke and embarrass the guys, she was one up on them. So she learned the skill and it continued throughout her life. So here we are sending these cards to each other and we continued until her passing. I found out later that she had done this with Fred Jerger. So I was now the replacement, which I didn't know I was, but I learned after her passing. And she even began to call me this nickname. I don't even know where it came from. She called me Bushate, B-U-S-H-A-P-E. I just thought, well, it's a term of endearment. I'm not going to question it. Later, in what we called the dig, where we would, you know, go through Harriet's things, and they, the family didn't know what these things were and the value of these things. So I was helping them understand the history of the things Harriet had kept. And we ran into cards from Bush Shape, and that was Fred Jerger's name. So the whole thing was as magical as you would think it might be working there. And then when I find out that I'm in Fred Jurger's spot, and then I start working with Walt Paragoy. And I'll tell you how this all began, because it was at the very beginning when I showed up that first day. Maggie took me up to Rolly Crump's office. And Rolly Crump was in charge of the land pavilion. Walt Paragoy was one of the main artists designing it. And I walk into this room uh, with Rolly Crump and Walt, and they're talking about this fountain that they want me to build the model, which we didn't know where we'd go from there. But here I am meeting these two guys and don't really know who they are, except Rolly. I knew his last name because a girl I went to school with, Roxana Crump, I thought, how many Crumps are in there in the world? And I asked him and he said, that's my daughter. So here I am, friends with wow. Rolly Crump's daughter. And then my first job is with Rolly Crump and Walt Paragoy. And when I got out of the meeting, I went to, to Maggie. I said, why on my first day are you giving me this huge project with these two incredible designers? She said, well, you said you could do this and you want it in here bad enough. Let's see if you can prove it. Oh, boy. What a test of fire. But I got in. Walt and I hit it off. A lot of people had trouble working with Walt. Do you know of Walt Peregrine much? Oh, yeah. His work on the animated films is incredible from even in the 60s and 50s. Yeah. Uh, what an amazing artist. A true artist spirit. Very unlike most other designers in the theme park business. But with animation and the theme park designs, he was a very unique artist and man. And people had a hard time with him because he was very passionate and he was very outspoken. As maybe you've heard some interviews, but Walt and I just hit it off. 
And we got along great. He liked my work. He would do the two-dimensional sketch, and I would sculpt out of wood, plastic, whatever, what his vision was in miniature. And so he called me in any time at a project. I had no problem with him, and he and I just worked very well together. And he was best friends with Harry. So you can imagine, here I am, I'm probably in my late 20s. They're in their 50s. Walt and Harriet both became my best friends. And I have said they were the youngest people I have ever met in my life. Playful, fun, crazy, naughty, and wonderful. And here's a weird link. Fred Jurger was close to both of them. And have you heard of Fred Jurger's house out in, I don't know if it was Pacoima or Sun Valley? No, I haven't. I haven't heard about his house. I would love to hear about it, though. His house was like you walked into a Hollywood set. He had forced perspective gardens, a huge pool, fountains, a sculptures made by Walt Paragoy, and I don't know how many fireplaces he had. He had a stream that came in through the living room. Fred Jordan was very private, but he was very close to Walt. Walt and I are working together, and Fred invites Walt to come to his home because he's built a special room to showcase Walt Paraguay's artwork. His paintings were set into the wall with lights inside the wall. So the room was definitely a showcase for Walt. He said, I want you to come over and see the room I built around your work. Walt calls me and said, Jim, we're going to lunch at Fred's. I said, why am I going? (laughs) He says, well, he invited me. I said, I wanted to bring you. So, you know, Walt was very much my mentor, and he wanted me to learn everything he knew and just kind of take me in. So I went to Maggie, and I said, I've been invited to Fred Jurger's house. And I said, I don't know how long I'll be. Do you mind if I take a little extra time? She goes, Jim, nobody goes to Fred's house. (laughs) She says, go and spend as much time as you want. I want to hear all about it. (laughs) Wow, because his involvement is so in Disney world, but especially in the original Disneyland and some of the castle and everything. Wow. That's, that's, that's something. I mean, you can imagine, I, you know, I'm telling the story and sometimes I have to pinch myself saying, (laughs) how did all these unique, wonderful experiences come past me? And so there I was sitting, I remember bringing two bottles of champagne and we sat and drank the two bottles. We were all buzzed. And here I am, sitting with Fred Jurger and Walt Paragoy and we're all buddies. So this just doesn't happen, but it did. So of course, Maggie wanted the whole story when I got back. And, and that was one of those times where you just can't believe you're really experiencing something. So that was how things started. My relationship with Harriet was just amazing. And then all the projects that Walt would bring me in on as well as Roly, The fountain was the big one. I don't know if you're familiar with the fountain in the land pavilion. Oh yeah. That's, that's a big one that really stunning fountain. It's just really too bad that it's not there anymore, but that pavilion, I'd love to hear your stories about working on the sculpting of that with, with Waltz doing the sculpting for such a cool fountain. Well, it started out with um, foam. I'm trying to think of the name of the foam we used. It's a very dense foam, similar to florist foam, but much more rigid. So I sculpted the plan that Walt had for me. He gave me a three-dimensional drawing, four basic food groups, and I sculpted this and then coated it with an epoxy. Well, it was all white, and then it was colored lit with gels. As I'm working on this, Marty Scalar and John Hinch were the supervisors that came around and saw what we were doing, liked it, didn't like it, gave us advice. So the day we're going to present the model, Walt is not in, which, you know, he's very much a huge part of this, but I'm there doing the presentation. And he had designed a top that we put on top of the fountain. And Marty and John both said, but we love the fountain. We're not so sure of that top. They said, look, we got to get this going. I know Walt's not here, but can you do something different? I said, well, I guess I could. So that night I took foam pieces home. I went in the bathtub shower, pulled the curtain because this foam went all over the place. And I sculpted something that was a little more organic. 
Walt's design was a little more space age and they wanted something that fit the fountain with the theme of foods. So I did some kind of abstract leaves that were on the top. I brought it back the next day. They saw it and said, that's it. Go ahead with the fountain. Then at that point, the decision was that I was going to sculpt it out of clay, oil-based clay, which is what was used in the, the sculpture department, Blaine Gibson. Now, Blaine is the head of the sculpting department. He is the sculpting department. And he finds out that they had given me the job of sculpting. And he went to Maggie and said, this doesn't belong in the model shop. You did the model, but now that it's full size, it should come to the sculpting department. So he and Maggie kind of worked something out and he said, okay, let's let Jim do it. But he'll stay in the model shop, but would you mind if I oversee this and train him? So another freaky thing. I get to be trained by Blaine Gibson. So yeah, he would come, give me little tips, give me tools that he let me keep. And later in life, it is strange because Blaine Gibson ended up as a partner to Harriet Burns. So I would come and visit them in Santa Barbara, where I live now, and Blaine and Harriet were an item. Her husband had passed away, his wife, and the two of them hooked up. Hooked up is a horrible term, but she'd love that. <laughs> so I'm seeing Blaine off and on, and I said, Blaine, do you remember the tools you gave me? He goes, no, I don't remember. I said, I'm going to bring them to you. I want you to sign them for me. So he signed those pieces for me and remembered the fountain. And, you know, the thing I didn't tell him or anybody, including Walt or Rowley, but I knew that this fountain would have no identity to me. And, you know, it would never say sculpted by Jim Sarno. Now, it, they do now because in this day and age, we're allowed to be known. But at the time, everything was Walt Disney. So I came up with a crazy idea that in the panel where the fish food group is, a lot of curves, I would sculpt Sarno, kind of stylized, and hide it six feet across the fountain. So I did, and it ended up <laughs> in the fountain. And when I was there for the opening, I heard a guy saying, we've heard the artist sculpted his name in this fountain, but we don't know the name, and we don't know where it is. I felt like to walk right over and tell him, but I'm just going to leave this be a secret. So there it stayed. And I said, if I said anything, I could see them bondoing over it to hide it. So I just said, I'm just going to keep it my secret. Yeah, the found story, I, I, because I had transitioned from building the model to the full size, when it came time for it to be sent to Florida and installed, they had somebody else take over. And I said to Maggie, I said, I've been on this project since that day you threw me in that office. And I said, now that it's going in, I'd surely like to follow it through to the end. Well, we didn't plan on that. She goes, um, okay, okay, you're going to go. She says, you'll go tomorrow. We can't get you on a commercial flight. So tomorrow morning, go to Burbank Airport. You're on the mouse. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. And when I arrived the next morning, there is Walt Disney's private jet with Mickey on the tail. And I get on board and I cannot believe <laughs> they apologize. We can't get you on Delta. So you're going on Walt's private jet. <laughs> That's terrible. I know. Can you imagine? I almost said, no, I won't go. <laughs> I sat at Walt Disney's desk and wrote postcards to everybody I knew. You'll never guess where I am. <laughs> I get to Florida and right there at Orlando or airport, right on the, the tarmac there, they've got all our cars lined up. I guess there were maybe eight or 12 of us. And they gave us our keys and you drove from the private jet over to the property. They put me up at Fort Wilderness and I had a canoe to row over to Epcot and get out and oversee the installation of the property. Was that a challenge to just get in the canoe and go to work? <laughs> what do you mean a challenge? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> you mean, how would you get there? Yeah. Do you have materials you got to bring? Or <laughs> No, see, everything had been shipped there. My only job was to work with these very difficult Southern construction people. Now, for me, I had a mustache. I've always had one. And whenever I went on the property in Florida, 
the people would freak out. And I thought, why are they acting so strange when I show up? Because in Disney World, I think even Disneyland, you couldn't have any facial hair. So if you had facial hair, I learned later, that meant you were somebody pretty important. (laughs) Because not everybody could do that. It was a very strange experience, but I kind of made it fun. And I thought, well, yeah, I could drive over there, but a lot more fun to look on the map, see where the waterways go. I'm just going to canoe to work. Didn't need anything except my drawings, my hard hat, and that was it. You know, part of creativity, whether it be building a model, sculpting, whatever, is living creatively. And, you know, now that I teach kids, I tell them creativity is about everything in your life. It's not just about art. It's about thinking outside the box, doing things that people wouldn't do, you know, just making life an adventure. So I think I've always done that without even knowing what I was doing. And when I look back now and think of all the things that came about, because I just let myself be adventuresome, uh, curiosity and adventure, it just makes life pretty exciting. It was pretty amazing. And then to be there when Walt would come and he was working on that big entrance mosaic wall. And uh, so we'd look at that and then we'd go in and check the fountain and the balloons. And he he did a huge backdrop. There was a, a restaurant called Four Seasons that was up across from the balloons on the second level of the land pavilion. And he did these four Japanese women in kimonos for the Four Seasons of the world. So it it was pretty wonderful to be there at that time, watching all this go in. They had me work on uh, imagination a bit, not full size, but in miniature. So making uh, a grotto where figment lived, just sculpted again out of that green foam. And I even attempted making dream finders, dream machine, but it got rejected. So there were many projects you worked on that were, tried and then if they liked it it worked or it got dismissed and they went on to something else they even had me work on the tron model from the movie and the movie didn't make it in the original form and so that ride did not happen oh i'd love to learn a little more about that so um what was the model like Uh, the model was going to replace monsanto so it was all going to be black light and just a lot of strings of light and the characters jumping around. And uh, so the whole model was built. And then the movie just didn't do well. So they said, well, we're not going to use that. And they went on to something else. On um, the imagination. So what was that like to kind of work on that model for that scene? That was pretty wonderful. I think the strange thing is that when we were doing this, we all knew what we were doing. I think we were so wrapped up in the fun and the enjoyment of what we were doing. I don't think we had any clue the significance of it or how it would now, what, 30 or more years later, still have an interest to people. And we all knew it was Walt's last dream. And I think the best part of any of these projects were the people that we got to work with. Doing the projects, that was exciting enough. But all of the old timers were brought back for Epcot. I'm trying to think of who I worked with on imagination. I don't remember who was in charge of it. Walt might have been part of it. And then I was pulled from there to work on Spaceship Earth and Communicore. So I actually went over the Tahunga building to do some actual props that were in Spaceship Earth. And even the entrance, which was like a time tunnel, where you get on the ride and get off the ride, you go up the first slope and there's all kinds of images and black light. And then walking down the hallway on what we call the Gold Coast, where all the top designers were. Do you know the name George McGinnis? Oh, yeah. George McGinnis, you know, Space Mountain and Horizons and everything, for sure. So we're walking through the hall, and I, I, I think it was kind of an accidental thing. I, or maybe I was sent to meet with him. He sketches on a little white paper napkin, six inch square. Jim, we need a robot real quick. Can you do something like this? And he sketches out this cute little stubby robot, smart one. And I said, sure I can. 
So I took that napkin, and I know I have that napkin somewhere, but I haven't found it. And I went to a hardware store that night, and I just picked up pieces of plastic and tubing and wood and knobs for a dresser. And I went back the next day, used the band saw, cut this all up, and turned it into Smart One in like a day or two. I brought it back to George. Says, this is exactly what we need. <laughs> I said, great. And I, I thought to myself, you know, I'm cutting this all up to make Smart One, who I called Robbie the Robot. But I cut a second batch of parts. <laughs> so... Uh, this is why Retro WDW is excited to have me go in the fall to bring my box of Smart One prototype parts. Yeah. So I have the the makings for a second Smart One. So that this is how things would happen. It was a very close knit group. You'd run into somebody, they'd ask you for something. Of course, it needed to go through Maggie. But like I said, I don't remember if she sent me to meet George or we just ran into each other in the hallway but it was from a little sketch on a napkin. Yeah, I remember because I went, I was a kid in the 80s when Epcot opened and I remember doing the trivia with Smart One and that being like a big thing, like the, you know, of all the Communicore stuff, that's what, I remember that in the roller coaster from Communicore, the most of anything. So, and it really stands out. There's a lot of people that did that like me that now, like if you, when you bring that, those pieces of that model to that event, the Retro Magic event, People are going to lose their mind I said, in excitement. I, I guess so. Well, the fun part is I hear that somebody else made a replica. And I've got to talk to the guys to see what the story is. But they said, when you give your talk about how this all happened, we have a replica that is, the, he's done the electronics too. So I don't know what the smart one will do, but they'll see that. And then I'll be able to pull out my magic case <laughs> <laughs> of how smart one came to be. And for me, I think that's the exciting for them to think, gee, we've loved this character and we followed it and wondered all about it. And now they get to see how it was put together. Well, yeah, because people who went probably didn't think that much about, well, how did the model work and how did that come together? So I'm sure it's really interesting to people now to kind of think more through how it came together. Yeah. And, you know, even when I teach kids and I realized that when I was growing up, there was nobody who said, oh, I'm a theme park designer. You know, if that had been the case, I mean, I would have been all over it. So I just happened to get into it. But now to be able to tell kids or anybody who's interested, you know, you see things, you enjoy them, but you have no clue how they came to be or how does somebody come up with this? It's nice that now there's enough interest. And Disney is in support of us telling our stories where before it was all top secret and hush hush, you know? Yeah. No, because there's so many stories to tell and it's great that, that you're able to do that, to tell those stories. Yeah. And again, like I say, the projects are one thing, but the people, you know, to be friends with Harriet and Walt and Roly, even Fred Jerger, George McGinnis was the robot. And then also Frank Armitage, Frank and I worked together on um, Wonders of Life Good. was the pavilion. Well, I worked with Frank, and Frank had a medical background, so he was the right person to be in charge of that pavilion. And I worked on doing fiberglass body parts, which, of course, maple was exterior skin shells. Now I was working on interiors like the kidney, all made in fiberglass and plastics that were melted and stretched and turned into look like you're riding through the body. Well, a little personal story. I was dating Karen Connolly, and Karen Connolly became Karen Armitage. So, like I said, this was one big party where we were all having the best time of our life, and it was our social life, our work life, our personal life. And, uh, you know, we all connected on many, many levels. Yeah, it sounds like a great time because, you know, with Epcot Center opening, I know that it was pretty chaotic, and I mean that in a good way, but just really hectic because there was such a rush to get to the certain opening date. What was that atmosphere like? Was it pretty pretty intense, just everybody working so hard to finish? It was intense with a light frivolity about the whole thing. Everybody was taking it very serious, but we had the best time ever. Everybody in the model shop 
was so close. There were there were quiet, seclusive people that stayed to themselves. But for the most part, it was a party. And we were getting paid. It was such a good time. And like I said, these people that we worked with, were just, they were historic. And uh, here we were side by side. And of course, you know, while you're working, you're talking about your life and stories. And so to hear of all these things, one time we did a, a rehab at Fantasyland. You know, it was getting old. Mm. Things were made out of wood and material and things were breaking down. So they wanted us to rehab the whole fantasy land. And this is when they pulled up the drawbridge for the castle, closed it down. I don't remember how long it was closed. And one day, some workers that had been sent to the park to demolish things came back to Harriet with the windmills from the storybook land ride. They had the actual windmills that Harriet had made using wood and celastic, these old materials. And they said, Harriet, we were throwing this out. And we said, Harriet would love to have these. She made them. Now, this is original Disneyland. They give them to her. And Harriet thanks them very politely. And she looks at me. She goes, Jim, what do I want this for? I said, Harriet, that's original Disneyland. Nobody has these things. <laughs> oh, you can have them. And she gave them to me. She said, Jim, why are you keeping all this stuff and collecting everything? You know, we'd have uh, We Can Do It badges and posters and medals and a, actually a key to the kingdom. When they when we finished the rehab, uh, they invited us to a party where they dropped the drawbridge. The knight on his white horse comes running up to the castle, fights with Maleficent, who's a giant balloon, and there's fireworks and everything, and the drawbridge is dropped and all the employees walk in. So they gave us a pewter key with a key to the kingdom, thanking us for our work. There were things like that that happened. Another time, Harriet was working on a project that required her to use an animation desk. So they bring the desk from the warehouse. It's dusty and dirty. And I said, Harriet, let me wipe this down for you. Oh, don't bother. I said, please. So I'm wiping it down. I pull out a desk drawer and these little papers fall out. I pick them up and they're little thumbnail sketches and pencil the Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, my gosh. Harriet, look what I found. She goes, Jim, those are the original thumbnail sketches. Mark Davis showed to Walt Disney to get the ride going. Well, what should I do? She goes, they've been in the warehouse for 20-some years. Nobody knew they were there, and you found them. She goes, they're yours. You get to keep them. <laughs> she said, oh, wow. well, I'll take, them to, I'll take them to Mark and have him sign them for me. Oh, she says, don't do that. He'll think they're his. And nobody knows they're gone, and nobody knows they were in there. She says, don't bring them to him. Just take them home and enjoy them. So there I have five little original thumbnail sketches. And, and, and the funny part is, there's a very classic photograph of Mark Davis, Walt Disney, and Blaine Gibson looking at the sculptures of the heads of the pirates. And it's right at my booth that I worked in. And then here I end up with these original thumbnails. Another kooky thing, like, how does that happen in somebody's life, you know? Yeah, it's crazy to think about all the history that you were sitting at it in your spot where all this historical stuff happened. Yeah, I mean, I could have been put anywhere in that building. And how these things happen, I don't have a clue. But it sure made for a memorable experience being there. And now that it has second life, you know, it's just hard to believe. Yeah, for sure. So I know that you you left Disney in um, in late 1984. And I'm just curious about some of the other projects you've done since that point and some of your other work that you've worked on. Uh, well, when I left there, I actually began teaching art to young kids. They were really good in the layoff. I mean, you probably heard horror stories of people getting laid off. They actually carried them out with security guards as they were crying hysterically. But it was because people had such an identity that they were Imagineers and they worked at Disney, and now that all disappeared. For me, I was kind of done. I mean, I, I could have enjoyed it, but they kept telling us, look busy, look busy. We don't have anything until Tokyo comes in. Well, it's hard to look busy. But remember, Roly, when he invented Small World, it was a look busy time. He was doing these on his lunch break. 
little tin wheels and stuff, mm-hmm. and it turned into that. So I wish I'd been smarter and just looked busy and created the next great ride, but I didn't. So I actually went in and said, lay me off. This is killing me every week. Is it me next? You know. So off I went. Uh, they provided all kinds of resources for us to get other jobs. And Peggy Van Pelt knew of an art teacher that she thought I would like to meet and hooked me up with Mona Brooks, and I began teaching kids art in schools. So I did that for a while. Then Ken Forsey called me and said, Teddy Ruxpin, come to work for me, and you're going to sculpt the characters. So I sculpted Teddy and the Fobs and Grubby and was actually offered a partnership in the company. But it was a complicated mess where he wanted me to take over a department, not tell his old buddy what was going on. I said, Ken, I cannot do that. He said, we're going to cut you in. You're going to have shares. I said, that sounds wonderful, but I, we've got to be up front with this guy. And if not, I can't do it. So I walked away from that. I'm trying to think what I went. Oh, I went to work for United Airlines and I kind of traveled the world. My first dream was to work at Disney. When I completed that, I said, well, what next? I said, well, I'll travel the world. So I went to work for United and flew everywhere and then would come back for specific projects like the Teddy Ruxpin. I started a furniture design line of uh, Santa Fe furniture, stenciling, selling at the design centers in LA. That kept me going for a while. And then I moved up to Monterey. So from Burbank, working with the airlines, I transferred to Monterey, California. Didn't know anybody, but wanted to just move somewhere new. And I met McGraw-Hill, the publishing company. They were based in New York, but had a division in Monterey doing the testing for schools. And they wanted somebody who was an artist and could teach, but had a design sense because they wanted their corporate offices to be decorated with student artwork. So when they heard that I had the Disney display background and that I taught art, they brought me in as a consultant and it turned into a 23 year project traveling all over the country, teaching art and decorating their corporate offices for an artist and a teacher to have that long a gig in the corporate world was another wonderful thing that happened. And then I end up back in Santa Barbara and now I'm teaching at the junior college. I've ended up working with the boys and girls clubs up in Monterey and doing donor walls for them. So whether it be glass or marble, whatever they want, I've designed three of their walls and those are big projects to keep me going. And then doing my own work. I, I'm doing glass fusing, stained glass. I love pottery. I had a weird experience. You remember the movie Titanic that was out? Oh yeah. Probably 10 years well, you know, Rose, the character. Yeah. The real character that the Rose, the character is built on is Beatrice Wood. And James Cameron, when doing the movie, he heard about the ceramic artist named Beatrice Wood, who is a world renowned artist. But she had lived long enough and lived a similar. Well, he took her life story and called her Rose and put her on the Titanic. I had gone to see that movie in L.A., and on the way back up to Monterey, people said, oh, you're into ceramics. You should meet Beatrice Wood. So I call. I end up meeting her, and she's telling me her life story. And at the time, she was 104, and she's telling me about her life. And I said, you saw a big movie last night called (laughs) Titanic. It sounds like your life story. She goes, oh, that's all about me. (laughs) What are the chances, again, I'm in Beatrice Wood's home talking to her about this movie? And she says, well, did you like the movie? I said, it's a huge blockbuster. I said, it's wonderful. She goes, does it have a happy ending? I look at her and she goes, maybe I'll just see the first. (laughs) At 104, she's cracking jokes about the Titanic having a happy ending. What a character. Yeah, that's... It seems fitting, given all the characters that you've come into contact with at Disney and since, that that would happen. It's a, it's a great story. I, I'm continually amazed at the weird circumstances <laughs> that put me in touch with these people that I'm blown away that I get to meet or have anything to do with them. 
I've done a zillion things since Disney. I actually went back and worked on projects with them for Tokyo Disney, even went to Euro Disney. But I forgot a big one. People I met at Disney had a contract to work on Treasure Island in Las Vegas. Yeah, I've, I've seen this. I saw the show once, I remember, the pirate show there. Right. And what happened was Steve Wynn, the owner, wanted to create Pirates of the Caribbean into a casino. So he found some Disney people that could help with the design and the implementing of all the props. They were sent off to Kuwait to work on another project and asked me to fill in. So I went and made sure all the props and making the whole thing like a pirate village. So weird little things come up. You know, somebody contacts you about something and it's a tight knit group of people that all know each other and share when there's work. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that a lot of people that worked at Disney when you did or after then, even when they're not there officially or full time, end up working on a lot of similar projects like, like Treasure Island, which, yeah, you go there and it's basically, this all seems very familiar. <laughs> yeah. It's got the same thing going and it just turned into a casino. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different, but it has familiarity. Yeah. And I mean, the fun part in that shop was we had a warehouse. It just was a big room with shelves of all kinds of goodies. Now, do you know um, Didier with Walt's People? Oh, yes. I've read a few of his books and he does books on art too, which are stunning. Yeah. So he has asked to interview me, which I did a few months back, and I'll be in next year's book. And he wanted to catalog all of the things like the Pirates sketches I have and Harriet's stuff, uh, all these things I've collected that he wanted to catalog so we don't lose where they are. And so I did that and I thought, oh, I'm going to be able to use some of those images for my talk when I go in October. But I was thinking about another interesting thing that I acquired. Harriet Burns worked on the Tiki Birds. And Walt wanted her to have a bird that she could look at while she worked, just to really understand how they function. So he bought her a minor bird, brought it to her at work, and it sat at her desk until Joker, the minor bird, passed away. And she stuffed a Tiki Bird and painted it black and stuffed it in the cage. So every time you talk to Harriet, there was the stuffed Joker on her desk. (laughs) But when she had passed away, all of her belongings from work were in her studio. And I went to the house, and there I saw the cage. It just kind of shocked me because that had always been on her desk. So her granddaughter saw my reaction. And when I went to do a second memorial up north where they lived, they had given me the cage that Walt had given her it. With the stuffed Joker inside. <laughs> so all these fun little things. That's a great story. It's a perfect example of, of everything that, that you've talked about for the past hour or so. Jim, this is this has been awesome. I I loved hearing all those stories and um any it seems like everyone I talk with has things I've never learned before or heard, and you've worked on some of the more unique and creative things that happened at Epcot and everywhere. So this has been amazing. Thanks so much for talking with me. You're very, very welcome. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would definitely suggest that you check out my interviews with Rick Harper, Peggy Ferris, and Greg Meter. You can find those and a lot more at TomorrowSociety.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at TomorrowSOC or Facebook or Instagram at Tomorrow Society. If you'd like to get a hold of me, you can email me at Dan at Tomorrow Society. Dot com. And again, if you would like to learn more about becoming a member of the Tomorrow Society and helping to support the show, you can go to tomorrowsociety.com slash member. And if you would like to subscribe to the podcast or give a rating or review, you can go to tomorrowsociety.com slash subscribe. The Tomorrow Society podcast is hosted, produced, and edited by Dan Heaton. The music was written by Adam Hookey and performed by the Sophisticated Babies. I have shifted around the schedule a bit for the shows that are upcoming, 
But I will just say that there are some really fun interviews on the horizon for next month. Plus, I am definitely going to be talking about D23 and a recent trip report to a regional park. There's so much good stuff coming. I can't wait to bring it all to you in the near future. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast, and I will talk to you again very soon.